Uh, my name is Nikhil Trivedi again, and uh, I'm an application developer at a museum in Chicago, and I'm also a um, volunteer educator for an organization called Rape Victim Advocates. We're a social service agency that provides um, support on medical and legal stuff to survivors of sexual assault, as well as counseling services um, to survivors and people close to them, and education and training around sexual violence. Um, just to add to some of the sort of agreements we set at the beginning, um, anyone in the room might be affected by sexual violence, whether it's through our own experiences or people that we're close to. So I'd just like to ask for people to be cognizant of that and thoughtful of that before um, asking any questions and making any comments. Um, again, you can leave the room at any time, uh, and I'd like you to take that with you for the rest of your life. You never need to ask anyone's permission to ever leave any room ever, right? Um, and I'll, I'll be available during the breaks, and I'm going to stick around for a little while after the conference to answer any questions privately or to just listen for a little while. And just for um, a piece of clarification around language, I'm going to be using the term woman in my talk to reference anyone on the gender spectrum who's a target of sexism and sexual violence. And I recognize that that includes people who may not identify as the word woman, and this is stuff that I'm still trying to figure out and learn from. So if anyone has any sort of feedback around language, I'd love to hear your perspective after the talk. So I want to start by talking about a timeline that geek feminism has on their wiki. It's a timeline of incidents of sexism that has happened in geek communities. Are folks familiar with this timeline? Have people taken a look at it? I'm seeing uh, quite a bit of uh, nods around the room. So it's a timeline that goes back 50 years to 1963, like, like you can see here. And it includes things like um, verbal violence, uh, sexist jokes, um, shitty things people say about other people's bodies and stuff like that. It includes things like stalking and sexual harassment. It includes things like murder and rape. And these are things that happen in geek communities, including tech spaces, conferences, and meetups and things like that. So has anyone in this room, I'd like to ask, and I don't want to ask you to share anything or not comfortable sharing, of course, but if I may, could I see um, a raise of hands of anyone who's ever experienced something that could, that could be on this timeline in a tech or gaming community? So there's a decent amount of hands up. Um, so a follow-up question for folks who did raise their hand, are any of, those, any of those incidences on this timeline? I don't see any hands up raised in the room, right? So did I... Right, um, so, I, so the, the link to the timeline is here, um, but if you've submitted the thing that you're thinking about to the timeline, I'd imagine you may know that it's on there, right? But nonetheless, I'm not seeing any hands up in the room. So this timeline is significant, and it's important, right? Because it documents some really egregious things that have happened in our communities, but I want us to look at this timeline as only a slice of everything that's, hap that's happening and that has happened in our communities. Because we know that a vast majority of sexual violence goes unreported. Because rightfully so, people generally don't feel safe sharing what, what's happened to them. So, this, so I want us to look at this timeline and think about this timeline, but also recognize everything that's not on this timeline. Um, and I want us to look at this timeline in a few different ways, right? I want to just look at this timeline through the lenses of the layers in which oppressions operate. And if you're not familiar with those layers, it's personal and interpersonal. So this timeline is a series of real incidents that have really happened to real people, that have really been perpetuated by real people. So the personal and the interpersonal. I want us to take a step back from that and also look at it at the community level. These are incidences that as a community we've allowed to happen. And I want us to question the ways in which, as a community, we actually perpetuate this kind of behavior to happen. Taking a step further from that, further back from that, I want us to connect with the societal level of the, the way in which oppressions operate and recognize that the things that are happening in our community that allow this stuff to happen, that perpetuate this stuff to happen, isn't in isolation, right? It's connected with the ways in which women are treated overall in our societies. And if we take it a step further back from that, I want us to look at it at the institutional level. And when I talk about institutions, I'm talking about things like governments, like, like the system of academia, 
large institutions in our society that set policies or don't set policies that allow this stuff to happen. And again, question ways in which our institutions may be perpetuating this stuff to happen. And I want us to look at it in all these different ways because even if someone's not a direct target of this sort of violence, of sexual violence in our communities, all these incidences add up, right? All these incidences culminate to create this climate that sends a message to women that our spaces aren't for them, that, are, that they're not welcome to our spaces, and that they're not safe in our spaces, right? And I want us to recognize that we can't talk about sexual violence without also talking about racism, without also talking about classism and homophobia and transphobia and all the ways in which power is unevenly distributed between people in our world. Because sexism and sexual violence exist in parallel with all these other oppressions and are connected with all these other oppressions. And we can't talk about one without talking about all the others. So I want us to keep our minds connected with all those different ways that oppressions operate in our societies because we're talking about all of them at the same time right now. And there's an interesting contradiction here when we look at this timeline, right? Because a lot of us have found our people, I'm putting our people in air quotes, I don't know why, really, but I'm, a lot of us have found our people in these spaces, right? Lifelong relationships that we couldn't imagine living without, right? For a lot of us, these tech and gaming spaces are some of the safest places we've ever found for ourselves. Yet at the same time, clearly for many folks, these are some of the most unsafe places that they've ever been. That's not what I want my community to look like, right? If we want to make our spaces safer for women, we need to talk about sexual violence. We need to be able to recognize it and name it to many varying degrees. We need to have a sense of how to support survivors of sexual assault. And we need to interrupt sexual violence. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Which is kind of a no-brainer, right? Like, you'd have to be a fucking jerk not to want to end sexual violence in our communities, right? <laughs> So what, what, gets, what gets in the way? What's stopping us from ending sexual violence right now at like 12.57 or whatever? 1.56, I'm still on central time. So, <laughs> so what gets in the way? Well, speaking from my own perspective as a cis man, are folks familiar with the term cis? I'm seeing a lot of heads in the room, but just in case, cis uh, refers to someone who's um, who, whose gender identification matches the gender they were assigned at birth, right? So I identify as a man, I was assigned to be a man at birth, right? Those things match for me. So speaking from my own experience as a cis man raised in the United States, we learned, as men, we learned to act out, and again, using men in that broader sense that I referred to, referring to women as well at the beginning, we learned to act out patriarchy, right? We learn to act out patriarchy by learning masculinities that are toxic to ourselves and to everyone around us. We learn these masculinities that teach us that power is equal to domination, to domination of women. And this kind of learning damages us. It hurts men, you know? It, it reduces our full humanness to only being allowed, only be given, be given the space to be these sex and violent machines, you know, where there's no space for emotion, there's no space for vulnerability, and it's, it's really isolating. And a lot of us learn really similar lessons in pretty different ways because there's no one masculinity. Like, the idea of a universal masculinity is bullshit, right? Because masculinities vary by things like race by uh, sexual orientation, by gender, right? Because cis men don't own masculinity. You don't have to be a man to be masculine. You, you don't have to have a penis to be masculine, right? That's, those two things are separate from each other. And I make this distinction between masculinities that are toxic and those that are healthy because masculinities in and of themselves aren't bad, right? Men aren't bad. But the ways in which we've learned to value ourselves as human through the amount of patriarchal power that we, that we use, that we have, that we unwield onto the world, like that's fucked up. 
and that's bad. But men aren't bad, and those are separate things. And in order to end sexual violence, when we're talking about the personal, the interpersonal, the communal, the societal, and the institutional, a significant part of ending sexual violence at all those levels is the personal and the interpersonal part. And as men, we have to sort of dismantle some of this stuff and unravel this stuff that we've learned that we may be acting out in our relationships with ourselves and with the wider world around us. And we'll talk more about that, but before we do, let's talk about um, recognizing sexual violence. And I think it's important that we um, know how to define sexual violence because if it's not something that we um, can define, it's not something that we can name as violence it's not something that we can seek justice for, and it's not something that we can heal from. So recognizing and defining it is a significant piece. And I think of sexual violence as being a spectrum of things, right? All of which are part of this system of domination, of this system of power and control over women. Some of the things um, that you might find on the spectrum is like verbal violence. And that's, like I said earlier, things like sexist jokes, misogynistic and hateful speech, um, shitty things people say about people's bodies. And I have no doubt that everyone in this room, can, we can spend the rest of this time talking about examples, right? The people have either witnessed or experienced a verbal violence. Also on the spectrum is sexual harassment. And we've already heard people talking about experience of sexual harassment in talks before me today. We can think of sexual harassment as any sort of unwelcomed sexual advances, and that could be verbal, or that could be physical, and that could be in person, or it could be online, right? Speaking to the I look like an engineer sort of um, response, right? It, it, it was, uh, some of it was online, and it's still considered sexual harassment. Um, it's typically something that happens in a workplace, but it could also happen in a group of friends, a team of developers and designers, because it can happen online, it can happen on Twitter, it can happen in IRC channels. Um, stuff like that. Also on this spectrum of violence, I would include stalking. And stalking is considered conduct that makes one reasonably fearful or creates emotional distress. It can include monitoring or following, and we've already heard examples today of things that kind of sound like stalking, right? Um, and again, it can be personal, in person or electronic. And on Geek Feminism's timeline, there are unfortunately many, many, many examples of stalking that have happened in our communities over time. One person was found armed in his car on his way to a woman's house who he was harassing online. Right, so the, the disclosure of her address not only gave him information, but he also had a plan, and he was found executing that plan. It's so f fucked up. Um, a lot of examples on Geek Feminism timeline include death threats, rape threats, along with the disclosure of addresses. Um, and I'm, not, I'm only going to say one thing about Gamergate, and that's right now. And that's to say that a lot of the, the stuff that happened in Gamergate falls into many of these categories, right? And stalking was a big part of it. That's all I'm going to say about Gamergate. Next on the spectrum um, is molesting and groping. And uh, the legal word for molesting and groping is sexual abuse. And uh, we can think of that as any sort of sexual conduct, touching, or showing any part of the body that you would put under a bathing suit. And just for clarity, for someone who's under 13, it includes any part of the body at all, right? Um, and the, the piece about showing is an interesting part of the definition of sexual abuse, because you don't actually have to touch someone for it to be considered sexual abuse. Forcing someone to witness a sexual act is considered sexual abuse. Um, and unfortunately, there are a lot of examples of this on the timeline too. In particular, groping. So many instances of groping in our communities. There was one example that happened on stage at the Hugo Awards. Do you folks know? Do you want to sort of give a quick summary? No? Okay. <laughs> well, it's, uh, there's a video on YouTube. Um, I'm assuming the genders of the people in the video, so I apologize if I misgender anyone. But um, this guy goes on stage to accept an award, and a woman is presenting the award. They're at the podium having some banner back and forth, and at some point he just puts his hand on her boob. And he kind of just lingers there for a minute, and then drops his hand down, and then she sort of awkwardly wraps up and walks off stage. It, it was very public. The Hugo Awards, right? People follow the Hugo Awards and know what they are. Ugh, okay. Deep breath. <laughs> 
<sighs> Next up on our um, spectrum, rape. The legal word for rape is sexual assault, and I'll often use those two words interchangeably. And in the state of Michigan, I'm from the work I do is in the state of Illinois. I, I looked up the laws in the state of Michigan of how rape is defined here, and it's defined very similarly as it is in Illinois. Rape is defined as any sort of penetration. Again, with any part of the body you would put under the bathing suit. Defining rape as any sort of penetration really broadens our culture's narrow view of what rape is, as something that happens between a cis man and a cis woman and involves va vaginal penetration, right? When we think of rape more broadly as penetration, it includes things like forced oral sex. That's considered rape. It includes things like forced penetration with an object. That too is considered rape. And unfortunately, there are instances of rape that are on geek feminism timeline. <laughs> Lastly, <laughs> um, sexual exploitation. Um, sexual exploitation can be defined as the exchange of sex or sexual acts for basic life necessities. So things like food, water, shelter, protection. It can also be an exchange for things like drugs or money. And sexual exploitation is really like the reducing down of all of one's options to needing to, to do a to sex or sexual act just to survive, just for basic life survival. So those are all the things that I would consider as being part of the spectrum. And again, these are all the things that sort of contribute to this climate that I talked about earlier. And I want to make a distinction. Nothing on this spectrum has anything to do with sex. Right? Sexual violence doesn't have anything to do with sex. Sexual violence is about power and it's about control. And the difference between sex and violence is consent, right? Because sex is something that people mutually agree to enthusiastically, right? people mutually agree to before something happens and every step of the way during something happening. At any point, you know, someone could say, hey, you know, I'm up for this, let's do it. Halfway through, they're like, you know what, I'm not feeling this anymore. It should stop, right? Because at, at, at any point that consent isn't given and something happens anyway, that's when something crosses the line between sex and violence. Nothing up here has anything to do with sex. I want to be very clear about that. So let's talk, let's just take another deep breath. How are folks doing? I'm seeing a few nods, okay, cool. So let's talk briefly about supporting survivors. If you only take one thing away from my talk today here, I want it to be this. I want you to hold these three things in your brain, just like tuck them away somewhere for the rest of your life. Anytime someone discloses something that happened to them, it can be hard for you as a person who cares about this person who's telling you these things. Even if you don't know what to say, if you don't know how to act, just hold these three things in your brain for the rest of your life and say them. I believe you. It's not your fault. You have options. I believe you. It's not your fault. You have options. I believe you because f the rate of false reporting of rape is really low. You wouldn't believe it listening to any sort of news in our world, but it's about two to eight percent, which is exactly on par with the false reporting rate of other crimes, right? And the cards are stacked against people so much to disclose what's happened to them. Just read any comments of any article about Woody Allen or Bill Cosby or Patrick Kane, right? These are the kind of things that people are up against when they share what's happened to them. In my view, people have no reason to lie about this sort of violence. I believe you and tell them that, they, that you believe them. Two, it's not your fault. Because nothing that anybody does asks for this violence to be brought to them. None of the responsibility of what happened is on the survivor's shoulders. It's a sole responsibility, it's a sole decision of the person perpetrating the violence. It's not your fault. And you have options. You don't have to know all, what all the options are. You just have to assure them that there are many, many ways that someone can process this. There are many ways that someone can seek justice from this. Justice doesn't have to look like the criminal legal system, right? There are many ways to seek justice from this. There are many ways to heal from this. So take a look around the room and make eye contact with someone and say these three things with me. 
Are people comfortable doing that? I'm seeing a lot of blank stares. <laughs> well, just look at me, just look at me, and say these three things out loud with me. I believe you. It's not your fault. And you have options. So let's talk about interrupting sexual violence. Uh, I think I might be a little over my time. Is um, Okay. Just give me a wave if I should stop. So when we talk about interrupting sexual violence, I want to go back to those levels in which operation, uh, oppressions operate. What were those levels again? Yes. Personal, interpersonal, community, society, and institutions. And I want to focus today on the first two, personal and interpersonal. I'm not going to give you strategies on how to jump in and be a savior when you see something that's happening. Generally, I'd like you to, if you have that sort of image in your head, I'd like you to throw it away. Because if you see something happening, every situation is different. It's really important to follow the lead of the survivor, you know? We know that sexual violence is about power and it's about control. It's about taking the power away from someone. One of the most important things we can do to support someone is to restore that power back to them by following their lead, even if that means not intervening when you absolutely believe you should, right? Follow the, follow the survivor's lead. But nonetheless, with the um, personal and interpersonal piece of dismantling this stuff, I, as, as for the men in the room, I want us to think about the ways in which we benefit. I want us to hold ourselves accountable for the ways in which we benefit from sexism and male domination. Even if we don't know that any of this stuff is happening, I don't think, it doesn't seem like anyone in this, this, these are new ideas to anyone in this room, but even if so, even if, if this is the first time you've ever heard of any of this stuff happening in our communities, I, I hope I've made it abundantly clear that these things are happening and to an alarming degree. By participating in the communities that we participate in, by getting whatever it is we get out of our communities, friendships, um, work, uh, relationships, um, we benefit from this current climate that I've been describing. By participating in the communities we're participating in, we're benefiting from this current climate. The more honest we can be with ourselves and the more vulnerable we can be with each other about thoughts and moments that we're unsure about, the stronger our relationships will become, the more open our communities will become, and the safer they'll become because of it. This work very much starts with ourselves in addition to needing to happen at a larger community and societal level. But I'd like to sort of leave you with this action then, right? Over the next week, I want you to find one person in your community that you feel comfortable having a conversation like this with. If they're not in this room today, talk to them about the spectrum of violence, and then exchange two minutes like this, where you're given two minutes to talk and then they're given two minutes to talk. I want you to find one person over this next one week and have one conversation with them. Is that something you think you guys can do? I'm seeing a lot of head nods. And I'd love to hear sort of what, what the experience was like for you, right? Confidentiality, I'm not gonna ask you to tell me what you guys talked about, but I'd love to hear what the process was like for you as a listener as well as a speaker. So that's the action I'm gonna leave you guys with today. Are there any questions? Okay, great. Like I said, I'm available during the break, so I'm gonna stick around for a little bit afterwards. Thank you guys very much.